This week on the Sports Initiative podcast, I sit down with Cat One Academy coach Graham Mills. Also a lecturer at Southampton Solent University, Graham discusses his creation of FIFA-style IDP profiles, the use of academic work in a practical setting, as well as the challenges faced when trying to create a positive learning environment. This podcast was also recorded over the internet, so it may sound a little different to normal. I hope you enjoy. Perfect. So, Graham, first of all, thank you for kind of spending your Monday afternoon talking to me. I guess the first thing is, how um, how is everything? What's it like being back on the grass and kind of back to some sense of normal? Yes. Yeah, well, first of all, thanks for having me. Um, it's, yeah, it's, it's been an interesting period, obviously, six months without really doing any coaching. It's probably the longest um, since I was about 18 that I've not coached for that length of time. So, uh I think there was a real sort of enthusiasm with the virtual program and doing things online because it was a little bit different and the, the kids, to their credit, really bought into that. But I don't think anything really replaces um, being on the grass and working with players. Um, so I've, I've missed it massively. So we've been back now for three weeks and uh, yeah, probably just, uh, I don't know whether I, I'm more enthusiastic than the players at times. Sometimes you've got to rein yourself in, but you have know, not coached in six months. It's, it's brilliant to be back out on the grass and, and doing what you love. And I guess, kind of alluding to that point, did you, did you have any challenges within that six months in terms of not coaching, in terms of how that affected you or things you were able to reflect on? Yeah, I think it's, uh, first and foremost, it's tough to deliver sessions remotely. Um, think that you have to be very creative with your, your session planning because there's so many variables um, and each player's circumstances are very different. So some, some players have got a local park, some, some have got a back garden, some uh, have got an apartment so they don't really have a lot of space. So trying to be resourceful and creative with that was, was a real challenge. Um, but to their credit, the boys did, did fantastically well with that. I think probably the longer it went on, the more um, sort of frustrated that I felt as a coach not being able to go and uh, coach players and, and have interaction with players, talking over a, a laptop or a computer screen, you don't get that sort of feel and that engagement that you would do on the grass. So, yeah, I think initially it was it was a challenge delivering in a different way. Um, but there's lots of positives that come from it as well. Uh, but yeah, the, certainly the longer it went on, the more I missed the, the social side of coaching, which that you can replace really and is there anything that the kids either picked up or improved on that either surprised you or you thought actually that's something we could move forward with going further into the future yeah probably initially we started off with a lot of technical ball mastery type practices which they you know the boys are very familiar with um but i think to, to maintain engagement the longer it went on, we started to really give them the opportunity to, to deliver and lead and come up with practices that they could then coach their, their peers with. Um, and some of the stuff they come up with was really good, um, really sort of innovative with the restrictions that they had. So I think that's something that definitely probably we need to do a little bit more of, even when we're back on the grass and giving ownership to the players um, and being, being comfortable with that. I think they, what they came up with was, was really really good some of the boys have got development plans and targets that they're working on and some of those couldn't be achieved in the space that they had um, but others others really focused in and honed in on that stuff and they were uploading stuff to Hive and blogging things and sending us some video footage and then some of the creativity that they demonstrated was, was really really good so I think probably just opening up a bit more freedom for them to do that um, not just maybe half an hour a week, but finding ways within the program where we can really sort of tap into that creativity they demonstrated that would be something I'd like to keep, yeah, for sure. Like what what type of sessions were they coming up with? So they um they they were asked to do a player led session for example. So we would put in a WhatsApp group um 
two players' names. So one would do an attacking practice, one would do a defending practice. Um, and they would send back a video. So they, they'd video themselves doing the practice, demonstrating it. They'd, they'd be talking over it. And there were some sort of annotations in there. It was like a really nicely put together video. And then obviously on the, the actual live session, they were almost coaching the players through it, giving points for effort or quality. Um, they, they put together little session plans and they shared their screen with. You know, it's, us learning it was difficult enough, but you, you look at them and their age and, and where they're at in terms of technology, technology and stuff. It was really impressive to see what they were coming up with. And did that um, throw up any surprises of, of players that maybe you thought weren't in such leadership roles in inverting commas? To actually when they engage with their peers in that sort of setting and have a real positive impact? Yeah, yeah, I think we probably in sport we've got a very traditional view of leadership and what leadership looks like. Often we're attracted to the confidence and the assertive leader. Um, but this really gave an opportunity for the boys to lead in different ways. So we've got perhaps more introverted players within the group. Um, who were, were putting together some, some really nice stuff and sharing it with their peers. And, uh, and maybe because they're not in front of them sort of physically, but behind a laptop screen and can watch them online, it suited them better. Um, and some of their observations, so like picking who got what points and why and justifying that and giving their reasons for it, you know, the analytical side was they could demonstrate that. So, yeah, I think. I think in terms of leadership, it, it gave opportunities for others to step forward and lead in a way that felt comfortable to them, which was interesting. And I guess the challenge for you moving forward is how do you incorporate that into a, again, very common normal academy programme? Um, have you yeah. any ways that you could potentially do that? Yeah, we've, we, we've discussed it in um, try, trying to put some of that stuff into their development plan. So can they explain what leadership is to them? What does it look like? Who is an example that would lead? Um, trying to trying to explain that, and it doesn't have to be the the vocal, the, the shouter on the pitch that's the leader. It could be the one that leads by example, or or ideas to the values of the academy, or demonstrates those in their behaviours. It could be many different ways to lead. So we're we're trying to embed that stuff into their development plans now. I'm glad you came on to development plans. So, obviously, one of the things I know you did a lot of work on over um, over lockdown and whatnot, and I guess before it, by the in-depth nature of it, is kind of IDPs in terms of players' individual development plans. I know um, from so your social media accounts, a lot of that was based around kind of FIFA-style work and kind of going off the back of that. Do you just want to explain to everyone kind of exactly what you did? And then, I guess format of it and then how you've been able to transfer it across to other sports as well which I've seen you've been doing that recently yeah I I probably I was working at AFC Bournemouth um, about five years ago now and um, I was having this sort of internal struggle with development plans I found that it was a very coach-led um, sort of transactional process so every six weeks each will be in the youth development phase you have to have a review um, and we were almost sitting down with the players and the parents and saying almost ticking boxes and saying this is where you are this is what we see this, these are the things we need you to do over the next six weeks 12 weeks whatever it might be um, and often the player only really looked at the ticks and where they were good and sort of read into the grade and then that piece of paper or that document might then go in a drawer and not really be reflected on. And you could ask a player during a session, what are your targets or what's, what's your goals for this period? And some of them didn't know. So it clearly wasn't a process that was, was working. Um, so that sort of coincided with a, a study visit that I went to PSV and they, they talked about how they turned it, the process around and it became about the player leading this journey. It was about them putting together the presentation and presenting it back to the staff and almost attributing accountability to them and saying, I need you to support me on this. So it became this sort of living, breathing document. So I tried to take bits and pieces of that and tried to wrap it up in a, in a process or a platform that was engaging to players. So that's where the FIFA um, sort of element comes in because obviously you know, 
most players and most young kids that are playing FIFA, the terminology and them understand the journey there is not ours. Um, and I can do it in a way that engage them. That that might be some way towards addressing sort of the, the conflict that I had around the development plans. So I took feedback from players, parents and staff over a five year period and then we got to where I am now with it and what it looks like and what I've shared on social media. I, I think it's really interesting because I think you know, particularly with, with those types of reviews and stuff, it's very formalised at points and you feel like you sit in front of a kid almost like a teacher role. And I like the fact you said you almost flipped it on your head and you've allowed the player to kind of explore kind of what, what they want to explore and go, go that way with it. When you were putting it together, were there any particular challenges in terms of Obviously, you still need coach input. It can't be all the player, but you want a certain level of autonomy. So how did you manage that, I guess, that balance between it being helpful for having coach support, but also being player-led? Yeah, sure. But the development plan is essentially a PowerPoint, so they can take slides out of that and add slides in, so they can really customise it and make it what they want it to be. Um, in terms of the coach being involved in that process as well, the the powerpoint is very much a framework so it sort of guides them through certain questions or certain things that we want them to consider um so like i guess what? there's a so there, there's questions in there about you know the, for, for older players i've used questions around contingency planning and secondary planning so you know if you get to 16 and uh, 31st of december you're informed that you're not going to be retained um, rather than that come as a real big shock in a, in a massive year where they're doing GCSEs and stuff. If at 13s, 14s, we've introduced the concept of contingency planning and what next and, and what are my options, how do I need to upskill myself to make sure I'm ready for that and so on, um, then hopefully they've, they, they've got an understanding of um, things that they may need to do and not wait until the last minute and then sort of panic or, or, or worry be overly worried about it but know that it is their journey and they if they put in place the right things whether it be small objectives or goals hopefully they can future proof themselves for any any setbacks or things that come along um, so there, there's certain questions in there around their biggest achievement today their, their biggest setback um, their aspirations their motivations um, there, there are various number of questions around education and other disciplines or support departments in the academy. Um, so there is a there is a framework there. Uh, and then obviously when they present this back, they're, they're often filmed, presenting it to us. So they'll get their presentation up and they'll talk us through it. And that's where the coach might sort of prompt or ask some questions. So if they feel that that goal is perhaps not relevant to uh, the position that they play in or the characteristics that the club are looking for for that particular player or position, then there might be some questions around, well, is that necessarily the right thing? What, how can you justify that? And we might try and try and guide them or support them towards something that may be a bit more relevant. Um, so yeah, there, there's, there is definitely a, some, some coaching input in the process, um, but perhaps not as much, or certainly not as much as when we used to just give them a bit of paper and say, this is what you've done well, this is what you've done well make sure you work on this so now you know it is a it is a two-way process largely led by the player but supported by the coach uh, i guess this kind of links back to what we said before about them during lockdown making ownership and creating sessions and stuff how has that process been from in terms of actually being able to go away and practice at home or clip stuff at home and whatnot how have you found the buy-in with that yeah, I think there's some um, generally across across the age groups that that's been really positive. I think they do really buy into their individual um, sessions and planning of those sessions. Um, something that I've done is that they get individual training time in the week. So we sit them down, giving them a sort of session plan, and asking them to plan a session uh, with their peers. So they might have someone who's working in opposition to them. Uh, topic or target that's opposite or they might complement each other and they'll plan a session 
and then go and put it together on the pitch. And then obviously the coaches will observe and feedback or challenge where necessary. But those session plans then get handed into the coaches and then we will draw them up on an electronic sort of drill diagram. And then that gets put into a book. So at the end of the season, they've got a, a booklet of all the sessions that all of them and their peers have done over the course of the season. It's almost like a manual, if you like. So if over lockdown, they wanted to go and work on something that wasn't necessarily a target they'd been working on, but it's something that they were, you know, probably the least structured period of their development. If they've been in the academy since eights or nines, and you know, they would be in 13, that might have been the longest period they've not had structured coaching. So having this booklet where they can say, oh, I fancy doing that, and one of their peers has planned it, they might take that. They might not necessarily replicate it like for like, but they might take bits of it and plan their own practice. I definitely think um, you know, they're very skilled at, at planning their practices. We don't want them to be coaches, but if they can understand sort of the why or the rationale behind what they're doing, I think they can be far more informed um, players and intelligent players, and that's what we're all striving to, to produce. So I think the individual stuff has been really key, and, and it's been highlighted during the lockdown period, which again is, is a positive that's, that's come out of this. I like the idea of that encyclopedia that they can obviously go to and stuff. And I imagine, you know, if you keep adding to that year on year, it's going to be pretty in-depth. Although you'll get some that will be crossover, you'll get probably some quite good ideas that come out of it. So I think that's a yeah, that's a real positive. And I guess I think is what you said there, although we don't want them to be coaches, if you, if you well, if I had a pound for every time you hear a coach say, if I knew this when I was playing, I would have been a much better player. We're kind of enabling them to do that now to a certain degree. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I think the the, the booklet is, is is a way of them peer coaching each other. So maybe not directly, they're not stood with them telling them what to do, but they can look at this is a practice that so and so has produced. And I really like it. I'm going to go and take it and maybe that's it or tweak it or write it the same. So you get that little bit of um, peer coaching as well. And I definitely would agree with that comment about. Uh, sort of, if I knew now what I knew uh, when I was playing, for example, I think one of the biggest things that probably improved me as a player was doing my sort of level two when I was about 18. Because, like most people, I go, I guess I just played, played because I enjoyed playing and loved playing and didn't really think about too much other than that. And then coaching really opened my eyes up to, to, to the why and why I did stuff. And, how I can improve. So I definitely think if we can start to embed some of that stuff in a younger age, we don't want them to, to be overloaded with information and some of it can wait until they're a lot older, but general principles around um, you know, how to, how to plan a session and get the aims out that you want, I think that can be quite healthy for players to understand that early. Uh, and hopefully they also challenge us as coaches. So they don't enjoy the practice or they think that it's not relevant or realistic or could have been better in some ways. So hopefully it gives them a little bit more insight so they can challenge and, and ask those questions. Because like I say, it's, it's a two-way street. It's not, it's not us always telling them this is the way to do things. Hopefully they're empowered enough to, to sort of ask questions and, and um, challenge back as well. And I guess it also allows them to ask the question why to a lot of stuff so why is this practice been put on or why isn't this practice working which is obviously a question coaches ask all the time but then yeah. often the reason is because you know you haven't set it up right there's not enough space to go beyond which then everyone can just step up or it's not wide enough which means you're not allowing width and depth and simple things like that so i guess that um the idea of you know, allowing them to constantly ask the question why it, it will really aid their development because then hopefully they can then get back to a game as to why is that centre forward doing this or why yeah. do I keep losing the ball in this area under this body shape or something like that. Yeah, I think most most academies in their, their vision or mission statement uh, will say that they want to produce creative, uh, problem solving, innovative players. Um, and I think that a lot of that stems back to the why and them understanding and having clarity around the why. So, yeah, I think if we can encourage them to, to ask those questions and, and consider the why, I think hopefully then we'll, we'll, we'll produce those players that, 
that are creative and you know, problem solve um, in action. Whereas probably when I was playing, it was very much you did what you was told and you, and you just followed the coach's instruction. And I think we're a long way away from that now, and, and for good reasons. Hopefully, that's coming across in the type of players that are now being produced. And then where do you see this progressing? So where do you see the progression from this moving forward? In terms of the development plan or? Yeah, yeah. Um, I think probably the the progression that would come next is that, that they're starting to um, involve a little bit more analysis perhaps into, into this and embed in that. So rather than just saying I've done this over the last six weeks or 12 weeks, actually providing evidence and support to say this this is what I've done, this is how I've come on, or this is how I've progressed over this period, um, and really providing that that evidence to support it. There, I think if if there was one thing that would be really would be if they could almost create their own framework. So at the moment, there's still an element of a, a framework has been shaped for them and they follow that through. They can obviously deviate off that path and add bits in and bits how they like. But almost sitting them down and giving them a blank piece of paper and say, what do you want? Support them in that process. And again, there's challenges to that um, because if you're working in a lead pathway, you know what the end product might look like and you know how you need to get through those developmental stages towards that. You know, if you, if you give them sort of free reign, that, that might be a challenge. But yeah, I think I think if they could if they could really lead that from the start to initiate that development plan, um, that that would be probably the next level. And I guess one of the most one of the most important bits of this is that self awareness. Because I, I mean, I don't know, I could be wrong, but I doubt Messi and uh, Ronaldo have individual formalized development plans, if you like, but they probably did and do have a level of self awareness as to why they've struggled or what they need to improve on, on areas that they can, you know, keep working on so they could make it super strengths. So I guess I, the purpose of this at the very bottom then is just to have a level of self reflection, self awareness. Uh, how important do you think that is for players going through a pathway? Yeah, I think that's that's the, a massive um, part of it to to be aware of what their strengths and weaknesses are, uh, and then being able to reflect on whether they've made improvements in those areas or whether further support is required. I think that's really important, and it doesn't necessarily have to be overly formal. Um, what it looks like for one individual can be very different from another. So for another, it might just be a, a conversation with the coach. Um, others, it might be this sort of document that they follow through. Um, but I, yeah, I, d I don't think it needs to be uniform. I d and I don't, we probably, the e -triple -P, there's so many benefits to the e -triple -P, but one thing is we don't need to, it's not a tick box exercise. This is a genuine living, breathing document that's there to try and help them get better. Whatever that looks like for that individual is important that we try and cater to those different needs. Because ultimately the development plan is only as good as the, the action that it um, stimulates. You can have the best looking development plan, bells and whistles on it, it looks fantastic. But if that just is, sits in a drawer or is wallpaper, it's, it's not really of any benefit. Whereas you might have a player who has a very sort of sketched out, rough idea of where they are, where they need to get to, but they put in loads of time into their practice. Um, they're sort of watching their games back. They're uh, identifying what they need to do. The behaviours and actions, the action plan that is a result of the development plan. That's the key thing, uh, not necessarily the document itself. Yeah, and I'll be honest. That's something that I probably had a lot of not sleepless nights, but partially sleepless nights thinking about over lockdown. In terms of it made us change the way we did reviews and I kind of looked at it and went actually for me for some of the lads it was far better they enjoyed because we were adding more videos and stuff into their reviews and obviously we had more time to do it but because we were adding all that aspects in 
some lads that hadn't been too keen in terms of that formal one-to-one or with parent one-to-two um, situation were really forthcoming over calls. So then it had me th- thinking about how could we do it better. And there was, there's a couple of players who they love being on the pitch and that's essentially what they want to do the entire time. And I kind of thought to a degree, are we wasting our times by having them sat in a classroom with me going through stuff? Or could we just show him on the pitch? Could we maybe show him on the pitch and then his targets might be something really simple. You write them on his football. And for him, because he always carries around a football, he loves being on the pitch. That's probably something that will ingrain more than me going through a document with him where he can't remember his review from last week and all that type of stuff. Um, So I don't know what your thoughts are around the creative side of it. Yeah, I I think I'm kind of leaning towards, I think. Yeah, I think um, I, I think like like I say with, with the FIFA um, thing, that's basically to get the engagement. So if there's a different way or a better way to get that engagement, that if they're engaged in the process, they're going to probably find it beneficial and just adhere to it and stick to it. I th- the idea of writing them on a board is, is brilliant. I think um, probably a good example would be. Stuart English at Birmingham told me about their foundation for me to use a scrapbook so the players get a scrapbook at the start of the season then they just put in clips sorry yeah, clippings from the local papers if their school played in there for example it might be something from a match day program it could be a picture that they've seen that they like it could be anything and they just they stick it in the scrapbook and that's their sort of portfolio of evidence of, of their development plan over the course of 12 weeks season whatever it might be so i think if we can be innovative around that stuff the the buy-in can be really powerful and that's really what's going to turn this process into to an action plan that's actually um, brought to life it's going to help them improve and then as, as i mentioned earlier obviously you've you've kind of gone across sport and been able to use it for different sports how's that transition been and how's kind of the feedback been in terms of other sports being able to use these documents? Yeah, I think probably the initial reaction that I got from a lot of people was that, similar to my experience of development plans, is that they were very um, transactional process rather than transformational, that they're there to try and improve the individual. Um, But often that wasn't really um, happening. So I found in a lot of sports, they, they have those same sort of conversations. So they, people from sort of basketball and hockey, um, probably the two biggest ones so far, um, contacted me and asked me if I could do something around their sport. And I think the feedback generally has been quite positive. Obviously, there's not an equivalent that I'm aware of, of FIFA in hockey. So there's probably still a little bit of a crossover of FIFA, but... The, the feedback has been, been quite positive and a few hockey folks have contacted me around putting together something for them. Um, which is nice because I'm quite a big believer in multi-sports and taking bits from different sports and different experiences. Um, so being able to have a chat with coaches from other sports, seeing what their development plans look like and how we can improve them has been quite rewarding for me personally. And then I get, well, for you, I assume that working in the role that you do, particularly at Stanford University, you get quite a wide spectrum of academic to other sports, all that type of stuff. How have you found that's benefited you in terms of being, how we'll have an access to all these different people in all those different fields? Yeah, I think I've, so I went to Bath Uni when I finished there in 2006. Um, and then obviously started to work in, in football and coaching um, and I've always had an interest in sort of trying to keep up to date because football and sport is so fast moving there's always stuff that's being introduced or, or things are changing so I've always had a keen interest in keeping up to date with that um, so going working at a university which I've been there near getting on for two years now um, I guess it's it's a nice balance I think when I got when I was working full time in football, as a former for eight years, I think you just become very entrenched in what you do um, and how you do it, and aligning that to the philosophy. So it becomes a very one-way 
doing things. Um, so coming out of that and going now working at a different club and working at a university, I think I've got a really nice balance because now I can talk about lots of different stuff that's going on in, in the university role and look at modern and up-to-date sort of research and papers. And, but then I'm also learning a different way of coaching and a different way of doing things in a different environment. I don't think there really is one way of doing something. I think there's many different ways. And it all uh, you know, context is king. Now I've got a really nice balance of, of different roles and environments there, whereas probably eight years into a run, I probably knew the philosophy like the back of my hand. I knew the types of practices that we did. I knew what the Marco was like. Of, you know, it's very much entrenched in that way of doing things. So yeah, I think it's it's been a nice change. Um, there's obviously you know, it was nice working full time in football, um, but I think the balance that I've now got, I think there's there's lots of positives to that, and the people that I can now interact with and, and learn from. Um, I think it's been really rewarding so far. Uh, with the academic stuff. I guess one of the challenges has always been how you then relate that into practices or how you relate that into academy, like you've just said there. Is there anything that over your last, I guess, couple of years where you've had a dual role of working in an academy and then working um, at Solent that you've been able to transfer across? Or is there any academic research you go, if we could find a place for that in football, I think it would really benefit us? That's a good question. Um, I think... With a lot of research that I read, probably there's a lot of good stuff that I read. Um, but I think it's also taking what's uh, what's relevant to you, because you can't just apply every bit of research that you find to to your situation or your circumstance. I think it's trying to. I, I guess with the experience, you develop a filter. Um, probably when I. I was younger and I, I saw a lot of our students at the university when, when lockdown first happened. There was lots and lots of webinars and they were going to loads you know, every day. And I think because their level of applied experience was, is lower at their age and their experience, um, they weren't able to really filter out what was, was relevant to them and what could be really impactful for them. I think from the over experience, I've managed to do that. So there's lots of stuff that I read. Um, which I think oh, that, that's really good, but probably doesn't fit for me or my club or, or where I'm at at the moment. So it might just be that you know, I, I just keep that to one side or bear it in mind. Um, You've got any examples of that? Yeah, so I think um, there's there's a lot of stuff around um, sort of you know, gamification at the moment. It's, it's talked about a lot and the benefits of, of that think that there's some stuff that I, I like from it and there's some stuff that perhaps I need to learn more of. Um, there's been potential, we do a small side of games like on a Friday night, for example, for the players where it's very much player-led and that might be an opportunity to trial some of that stuff and see how it fits. But obviously, when you're working in a, an elite pathway, there is a culture, there's an identity, there's a, there's, there's a process to the way players are developed and the more you introduce, so if you bring gamification in, that might be a, 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 a de detrimental effect to something else that's already in the program that's really valued. So I think you're always trying to find the balance. I think coaching for me in general, I very rarely work operating at the extremes. I think everything's on a continuum. I very rarely work at the extremes of any continuum. I think I try and find the balance somewhere in the middle and what fits for me. Um, so if, if we were to bring something like gamification, just I think we need to be very clear on how that fits so we're not overloading the players and giving them too much to consider. If it complements something that's already in the programme, then brilliant. But if it doesn't, then that conversation needs to take place as to how we can make it fit or, or if we can indeed make it fit. Um, in terms of examples of stuff that I've seen and tried to bring in, um, no, there's, there's, a, there's a few bits and pieces, but I don't, there's nothing that really sort of stands out at the moment. I think for the last year and a half, joining a, a club, a really well established club with a rich reputation of producing players, I think 
for me, it was about understanding what they do, the culture and the ethos and how players come through the pathway. I think if I was coming in and, and offering ideas and suggestions, I think it, um, I probably don't know the environment well enough to be able to do that. There might be a couple of things I might suggest to, to my line manager as small thing, but nothing big that I've read up on or researched to great, any great length. Uh, I think once I understand the environment, in, that might be something that I can help me going forward. But uh, at the moment, it's sort of just immersing myself into it. What's interesting there is that you've obviously you've been in a role eighteen months or two years ish, I guess, with the club that you're mentioning, and you said that you're still learning the environment. I find that really interesting because a lot of people who go into a new club or a new role almost want to stamp their imprint on it, um, whereas you've kind of gone the other way and you're almost going, "I'm going to take in as much as I possibly can and then add value." where I feel is appropriate. Is there any reason why you've done it that way or does it suit your character or why have you gone about it in that sense? Yeah, I think it's a bit of both really. I think uh, there is there is ego in coaching, um, but you know, I, I try to, um, I, uh, hopefully things that I do isn't driven by ego. Um, it's hopefully there because I care about the players and their development and want to support that. So I think if I was coming into an environment and I, I behaved or acted as though I knew the answer to things or how I could improve things, um, I don't think I don't think it would would help me. I think if I'm going to improve the environment, which is a fantastic environment already, if I'm going to try and help uh, offer any suggestions or ways to improve it, I think first and foremost I've got to understand that environment and the culture that's already in place there. Um, once I've done that, then then I can start to offer some some ideas. But I, you do see it like you're absolutely spot on. You do see a lot in, in football that people want to come in and stamp their sort of identity or their personality on things. And I think for me, it probably works the other way. I think I can only be 100% effective um, and efficient in the work that I do if I if I really get to feel and know what that environment's about. Um, so yeah, it probably probably comes into my personality a little bit in terms of going back to that leadership piece. I think my leadership style is probably more sort of um, economy supportive. So I, I I don't I'm not the traditional leader and want to, to be seen as the person who's got all the ideas and you follow me. I think it's about creating relationships and, and hopefully through the strength of those relationships you can support each other and work collaboratively. So it probably does come down a bit of personality, but also I just think you know, it's the right way to do it. I think that the club that I'm at is, is well regarded um, for the work that they do. So who am I to come in to, to, to try and challenge anything that would be appropriate? And I think what you've alluded to there regarding relationships and stuff, obviously well known, being in an environment where you respect and trust the people around you kind of allows you to take risks uh, as a coach or try things as a coach which I'm sure um, you know you're, you're a creative type in terms of coaching you kind of have to be to a certain degree um, something I wanted to kind of rewind back to a little bit was you mentioned it's probably the longest you haven't coached since you're about 18 years of age um, I don't know obviously working at the university you do you're kind of working with students now some of which are almost starting out at 18 to say I want to be a coach so whereas years gone by it was maybe failed as a player um, became a coach or retired as a player became a coach um, we're getting to the stage now where I think we're actually seeing some of the younger generation who want to be coaches um, and kind of their the whole upbringing is I want to go into that side of the game and be creative I guess my first question is was that the case with you when you were 18 or were you playing alongside it and then two what are your experiences of you know having those younger adults younger younger people who are looking to make a career out of the game how have you found that yeah I, and I went to Barfini and said I played football to, to non-league standards. 
Conference South was the, the highest I played. Never a professional, never in an academy, um, but loved playing football. And then obviously I went to Bath and was surrounded by some some people that really grasped my um, sort of passion for the game and, and made me see it from a different way. So coaching became something that I really wanted to get involved in. So at the time, sort of Paul Tuzel was there as, as the head coach, um, Andy Tilston, Chris Casper, Jamie Shaw, Ivor Powell was there. He was a massive inspiration if you know know him and his, his coaching background. Um, so that sort of turned me on to coaching. I did my level two with Guy Whittingham, who did come in and did the PFA level two with us. And then as luck would, would happen, there was an opportunity to go and coach in America over the summer. Um, so I went out there and coached boys and girls of all different ages, some club, community. And that two month in, intense period of coaching and traveling around um, was was brilliant and off the back of that I came back and I knew that coaching was what I wanted to do um, so probably from 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 that sort of age 18 19 I realized that that's what I wanted to do um, and then from there I assumed when I left university I would go into a sports job or a coaching job and it would be I've got a degree now but that wasn't the case it's such a competitive market there's so many people applying for stuff that I actually went and worked in in an office in finance and mortgage underwriting um, but again there was loads of positives to that which you now need if you're working in an HRP environment you need to be able to to do all the admin and the the IT stuff that now as part of a modern coach in an academy environment you need to be able to do but then the opportunity at Bournemouth came up and I worked in a college for five years directing the academy program there um, and that sort of really set me up and over that period of working in an office I was also coaching part-time going to school was coaching and men women, able bodies in disabled groups um, boys girls you name it I was coaching it and that's what really gave me the education as a coach I, I failed lots I made so many mistakes probably part of some terrible sessions um, but with all of that came, I improved and I started to understand coaching far better than I would have done if I'd have come straight out of university and gone into a one environment. So having those opportunities to, to try things, um, to fail and maybe take some successes when they came along was really, really important. And that's probably what I try and emphasise to students now at the university. I think they're very, very skilled at the, the plan and the review bit. I think they're very good at planning sessions and I think because everything's online now you know, on Twitter you've got lots of analytical sites and stuff you can really review and reflect on things and, and stuff but I think it's the do then they need to be out there gaining experience applied experience failing um, creating relationships because ultimately the longer I've been in coaching that's what it comes down to it's the psychosocial stuff I used to think it was all about having all the answers technical and tactical I thought if I knew everything, then I, I had the power as a coach to, to influence and lead players because um, they'd look at me as a bit of a guru or oh, he knows what he's talking about. But actually, whilst you do need that stuff, you're only as good as the relationships you form and the, the rapport and actually showing the players you care. I think that's so important. So, yeah, the students at the moment that I work with, I, I'm just encouraging them to go and go and coach get your boots on, get on the grass and, and work with players regardless of, I know a lot of people want to get to the top very quickly, but go and coach soccer tops, go and coach, you know, whatever it is, go and coach it because I guarantee you'll learn stuff from it. And those experiences will make you a better coach, will shape you. Um, so I, I'm really thankful that I had that experience. I, I think I wouldn't be the coach I am today if, I, if I'd have got that job straight out of university because I wouldn't have had the freedom to... To, to fail and, and work things out. I, I, I mean, I had this conversation with Ollie in one of the previous episodes. I'm 100% with you on this. Um, we both said actually most of our learning initially came in like a school community environment. Um, and like you said, they're putting on sessions where, you know, that aren't very good and you go, I need to improve that or, you know, having a massive class, some that like the 
games, some that don't, how are you going to engage with them and all that type of stuff. It, it then makes the academy setting seem so easy because you've got, you know, a group of kids there that are pretty good players of a relatively same standard that are all relatively motivated and want to be there. You know, when you go yeah. from that group in the morning to that group in the evening, you're like, oh, this is lovely. All I need to do is plan my session and get on well with the kids and I'm fine. Um, I, I guess the, the big thing for me is with those groups how do you see the progression because I imagine there's only so many schools or so many sessions around an area for them to go in do you see a real upskill for those that maybe spend three years going doing that just volunteering and stuff places compared to those who maybe just do it more theoretical yeah so on on a class we may have sort of 100 students in, in a class Sort of a lecture and then from that they'll be broken down into seminar groups but in that 100 there's probably about 60 percent of those that want to coach and then the rest uh, want to get into talent idea recruitment or analysis or a different field within football um but the ones that want to coach i definitely think there's there's a difference you can see the ones that have been out there and gaining experience and the ones that maybe just rely on the, the theory because when it comes to the practical assessments that are involved in the course, um, you can see the ones that have turned up to a uh, school and had, you know, been told that there's 12 players and 23 turn up. And they've been told that they've got a sports hall, but there's an exam going on that day, so they've got to go out and to the hard court and use that, and they've got any space. And that they're able to adapt and their observation skills uh, and ability to think on their feet. So they've got a really good plan, but obviously things deviate from the plan when the ball starts rolling. So you can really see those students that have, have gained a little bit of insight into that, gained the experience to be able to say, well, this is what I might need to do when this occurs. Whereas the ones that are really just coached purely from sort of theory or they're watching things on YouTube or Twitter or TV, um, they probably don't have that ability to adapt um, quite so well, but they have, they have beautiful session plans and real thought out detailed processes. But you know, it's probably not um, a linear process coaching, it's probably things happen, and the ones that have got that experience can adapt far better, I think, from, from my observation. So, far. and then when, when you're talking about um you know, I guess they're going to have assessments in a variety of different areas. Are those like road bumps something that you build into the assessments or is it just something that naturally happens in the chaotic world we live in where an area might be double booked or stuff, that type of stuff? Yeah, we try to, we try to make uh, it as realistic to what the industry and what, it, what real life is like. Um, so again, I used to be involved in uh, recruiting interns in my previous work and you would do things on the, the recruitment process to make it difficult for them so that might be telling them it's this number involved in the session and actually slightly different when they turn up there might be certain things that they needed to, we, we wanted to see what they were like um thinking on their feet a little bit um so we've, we've tried to build that into the the university program as well so there are certain challenges there to try and if they're not able to get the experience because like you say there's only so many clubs and schools in the, in the environment that they can go to some whether they don't have a particular interest in doing it or they've got a part-time job outside the sport they can't do it not everyone's got access to it so we try and build it into the program so if they're not getting it extracurricular then hopefully we can provide those those challenges or those bumps in the road like you said through the delivery of the program um, and it's all we're all there to learn we're all there to improve so we've tried to build quite a psychologically safe environment where they can feed back to each other they can say you did this really well but i suggest this and 360 degree feedback sessions with the students so we can all be honest and open because we're all there to learn and improve um, so if you have had a difficult day where it's been a setback and you've not responded as well as you would like to you can get feedback from your peers and from the tutors to help you so when that opportunity in the real world does come up you might have a few tools in, in your locker to be able to, to address that 
Have you got any examples of like, sessions or learnings or whatever that you've been able to take from your students? Because I imagine they'll have a different viewpoint to you and um, I imagine it would have chapped up some interesting stuff. Yeah, I think, so I'm, I, I never lectured before prior to um, Solent University. I, co I worked in a college, so you know, I had a PGCE and I could teach. Um, but I'd never lectured, and the idea of standing in front of 100 students was, was really daunting. Um, so I think things around my delivery I've, I've had to try and work on and improve. Uh, but probably the biggest thing so far is it's a very multicultural course. There's students from all around the world that come for this. Football studies is quite a rare course, um, and because there's a lot of success in getting students into jobs in football it's a very sort of sought after course to be involved in so we get students from all around the world so I, i've really learned about the importance of language and the clarity of the way that you communicate is really really important so i could be delivering a practical session at test park and my assumption is that everyone well, we all use the same terminology and we understand what that means but obviously there's students from, from all around the world there and I need to make sure that what I'm saying is, is clear for all of them. So again, it probably goes back to that learning how to differentiate when you, you're going into schools and stuff as a young coach and you've got mixed abilities. So some players are, are at academies um, and some have never kicked a ball before. It might be a bit of a parents get home from work. So it's just an after school club that they go along to and they're really interested. In how do you plan a session and get range of diversity engaged in practice it's really really tough so now working in a university i've got students that are interested in they're not necessarily interested in coaching they're interested in talent idea and recruitment but they've still got to do the practical element of the course as coach they might be coming from a different social cultural background different language so i've got all these different things going on and, and probably the biggest thing is, is the language and the communication that i've found so far uh, and getting that really clear and spot on is something that I need to continue to work on. It's not perfect, but it's something that I've become more aware of. When you're working with it in an academy, the range of difference is very small. So from the top player in the group to the bottom player in the group, probably the difference is not that big. Um, but in that environment, the range is, is very big. You've got some people that have done their B license and are trying to get into their A license. You've got some that have never done a coaching badge. So all these different things, I found probably the thing that I need to improve the most will be more conscious of is, is my language and the way that I communicate. So how do you plan for that in a set in a session plan? Because it's quite I imagine quite challenging trying to think about exactly how you're gonna phrase stuff or whatnot. How do you plan for that? Yeah, it's it's tough. I think what I've what I've tried to do is from what I've observed of a lot of coaching recently. There, there seems to be two and be last. There was more of an emphasis on demonstration um, and, and showing people. I think we don't necessarily do that as much now. I don't know the reasons for that, but I, I tried to, to step in and demonstrate um, as much as possible um, and try and show them to support my language. So if I'm using stuff that's very, I guess, FA centric because they're, they're in England and it's sort of aligned to what the level two looks like, if they're coming from, we've got students from like Colombia and Mexico and different parts of the world. If that might not be the terminology that I'm using, um, it might be that I support whatever I'm saying with, with some physical demonstration to, sh to show them as well. So I guess it's just trying to give them a flavour of different modes of learning. Again, using tactics boards and showing them. I, I guess that's probably the way that I plan it just to try and involve as many different ways of learning and different styles of learning as possible. Now they might not have a certain preference and there's, there's some research around that's actually debunked in terms of preferred learning styles. But I think if my communication isn't perfect, I can support it by, by demonstrations and visual aids and other things. Yeah, it, like I say, it's, it's something that I'm trying to improve on and working on. So if you've got any, uh, any solutions or anything that you've learned along the, along the way, then please feel free to 
Yeah, I'll have a think. I think the, the furthest I've had, I, I, similar to you, I went out and worked in the States for a summer and um, I, I went LA across to Texas and back again. We had obviously some Mexican kids and whatnot, um, which was brilliant and interesting because we were doing quizzes and we'd say, what's the uh, national language of England? And they didn't know it was English. <laughs> so I was like that's where for me it was a real big cultural thing of going actually those different cultures they have no idea what it's like um and I imagine you'd have the same on your course you'd probably be explain, explaining principles or ideas of play or trying to rationale it but I imagine if you've got people coming from all these different backgrounds they might just see the game differently they might just see tactics differently or they might have importance in different factors. Is that something you find a lot as well? Yeah, definitely. I think I think depending on where you've come from, it, your your learning is going to be shaped by that, that environment you've come from. Uh, but it, it's great for me as well because I'm also able to learn from them. So there may be some some, some coaches from Spain, for example, so young, relatively inexperienced in terms of delivery, but they've come from a pathway in Spain and now they'll say, well, we don't refer to it as that, we call it this, and then they might tell us um, a bit of context around it and why. Uh, so I'm sort of learning bits and pieces from them as well. So it's it's quite useful, especially as I said, being in an environment for eight years and doing it that way, to now having lots of different ways of doing it and lots of different suggestions and ideas. Again, I can sort of, I, I can benefit from that as well. So it's again, it's a two-way street. I'm trying to learn how to improve my delivery. Similarly, I'm getting the opportunity to engage with a very diverse range of people that I didn't have access to before. Has there been any game changes? Has there been anything that someone said or brought up and you thought, that's unbelievable? There's a couple of really uh, bright students that have just left this this year, so they, they've just finished their third year. One is involved in the Danish under-21s, he's an analyst for them. Um, and he's involved with the first team in terms of technical analysis for them. And then there's another lad who works for the Icelandic national team, and also Luxembourg as well. There's some students there that are very high profile that are very good. And sitting down with Thomas, the Danish analyst, and seeing how he analyzes games and what he does and the model that he's put together. Again, I'm not an analyst, but it's really insightful to sit down and see what what he's looking for because it might be very different to what I'm looking for and what I perceive to be a good metric for for successful performance. So things like that, I, I, whether they're game changers or not, it just sort of opened my eyes to to very different things that I perhaps wouldn't consider or haven't had access to or experience of before. Have you got anything that have you got any examples of that of something that he something he would look for that you'd be like that would not be what I was looking at. I remember we went through, uh, so they were preparing for an under 21, I think it was qualifiers for the Euros, and he put up a shape system on the tactics board, and he was talking me through how their uh, the coach uh, instructs them, so some of the things that they do around that shape, um, so things like pressing from the front, how they would how they would do that, what it looks like. So I sort of said, this is how I would do it, and then he sort of showed me how their coach would do it, who was a very senior coach very experienced and worked with the first team and stuff and it was very different so it just sort of made me think about oh, that's interesting I haven't really thought of it from that perspective uh, not to say his was right or his wrong again it's probably down to the context and what the opposition were doing but it sort of made me just think oh okay well that's 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 an insight that I wouldn't have had if I hadn't had this conversation with, with, with Thomas and we've been talking around that stuff, stuff. I guess one of the positives that you're alluding to as well is that you don't just have coaches on your course, you have those different facets in terms of talent ID and all that type of stuff. Do you feel that obviously coaching or working in that in those subsections that maybe you might not have traditionally worked in has improved you holistically? Have you been able to learn more with the analysis side or the talent ID side um, that you hadn't done before? Possibly, yeah. I, coming from some of my, my experience before my current club was a cat three environment so a lot less staff um, and I, I think probably 
being interdisciplinary was probably one of the strengths of being a smaller club is because there's less people involved, less moving parts involved. So, and often you have to get involved in other departments because you haven't got the manpower. So I would support SNC or I would go across and do some analysis and stuff. So I think I've, I've probably always been very conscious or mindful of being holistic or multidisciplined or having an interest in that. I'm no specialist in any of those areas, but I can at least sort of understand and take some information from it. Um, probably going into the university, I think the bit that I've benefited from is the students that are really interested in those fields will, will ask me questions um, and it tests my knowledge of that area. So rather than just being, I understand that area and now need to have more than just a basic understanding of it. I need to now be, because these, these students are hopefully going into a career path towards whether it be talent ID or analysis. So when they ask me questions or make suggestions or challenge, then I need to be able to know what I'm talking about. Um, so I think I probably, it's made me have to go away and actually, rather than just having a conversation with someone and showing that I, that I have an appreciation or understanding of what they're talking about, I now go away and layers to that level of understanding, which I think has been, that's probably been the important thing. I think the Thomas, who I referred to just a minute ago, he's probably a, an exception rather than the rule. So he's at a level that's probably beyond um, most students on the course. A lot of them are spying to be there, but they're probably not educating me or, or showing me stuff that I've not seen before. But what they are doing is, is asking questions and keeping on the toes and I need to be able to keep up to date with that level of knowledge so that I can support them. So that's been a, that's been a good thing for me. And do you think that working, as you said there, at a Cat 3 Academy and having that grounding where you had kind of a lot of different roles to play and a lot of support was one of those positive experiences that we spoke about earlier where actually it gave you a grounding in everything whereas if you'd gone straight in at Cat 1 and you'd only ever coached Say, for example, you worked, I don't know, PD, uh, if you worked in foundation phase and then you decided, actually, I want to go and work in the PDP phase. So you went from CAT 1 foundation phase to PDP phase, CAT 3, and all of a sudden you're having to do all these things. You'd be like, well, I never had to do this before. Do you think that was something in your foundations that supported you, kind of being able to go from, I guess, a holistic thing to more specialised now? Yeah, I, th I think so. I think everyone's pathway is different, but for me, I think starting out at uh, Cat 3 was probably the best thing. Um, especially at the club I was at, we'd just come out of administration, so we were a centre of excellence at the time. Um, you know, you were, I, I was often the minibus driver, the, the, the physio on the day, the coach, you know, I was doing all that. Yeah, every, you, you, you just did everything because that was what, it, what life was like. Um, and obviously, as the club went up through the leagues and the level of success that they got, Obviously, then we became an academy and started to work towards CAT 2, and it became a lot more professionalised with the EPPP. But having that experience of having to wear lots of different hats and spin a lot of different plates um, was, was really good for me because, like I say, I, I had no choice but to be interested in sports science and analysis because often it was me that was having to do a lot of this stuff or, or at least contribute to, to some of it. Whereas if now in a category one club it might be that you have people specifically for those roles that do those roles so I, I don't necessarily have to go across and, and get involved or engage in it but it's probably in my nature to want to understand it and, and get involved so I think yeah I probably learned a lot through those experiences and now being in an environment where I've afforded the opportunity to really specialize in, in an area of the pathway um, I think I'm better for it for having those experiences yeah how was it for you from a personal thing that like you've said there is you've kind of spent eight years with a club building them from relatively small small people small budget to then obviously a, a much bigger budget much bigger operational time all that type of stuff how did you find that process of taking something i guess and having like your vision of where you wanted to help it go so then obviously getting it pretty far down that road yeah, I found that process really rewarding uh, to have essentially a blank piece of paper when we was a uh, centre of excellence. The, the, the one thing that was 
sacrosanct or that had to be because the philosophy so there was a very clear plain philosophy of what that looked like but in terms of methodology curriculum um how we brought that philosophy to life and how we coached it and delivered it was very much open to me as the phase lead um as a centre of excellence, we never had a youth development phase lead, so I was the first one in, in that role. So I, I was inheriting a phase 12 to 16 that didn't really have any formalised plan or processes in place. So being able to come in and really put that together uh, and some of the, the progress we made in that period of time was, was really rewarding. And again, I'm sure early days I made mistakes and I put things in and changed things and Sort of my, my ideas probably changed over a period of time and I started to identify different ways of doing things. But again, having that opportunity to do that was really, really important. Again, probably it's helped me become a better coach by having that opportunity. If I came into a club, at, I think I was 27 when I first started working on the academy. So I was relatively late by club standards. I say probably a lot of young coaches, as you said earlier, are coming into the game now. Um, I think if I'd have come into a club with everything, all the processes, all the procedures, everything established and there, I probably wouldn't have learned or needed to have learned as quickly as I did when I was actually coming up with a lot of this stuff and putting it together. So yeah, it was, it was really rewarding process to see the club transition from just coming out of administration as a centre of excellence to a Premier League club with a with a, an academy. It's, it's a really rewarding process here. And was there anything that you look back at now and go, what was I thinking? As in something that you did at the start where you go, why did I do that? Or that was a bad road to go down? Uh, it's another good question. Um, yeah, there's probably a few things I would have thought. There were some things like, so we introduced um, multi-sports and we introduced futsal. So a lot of the things that we needed to do was to try and be innovative, I guess. To, because you had Southampton, you had Portsmouth, who at the time when I joined were still sort of Premier League or probably Championship at, a, at an academy for a number of years. Um, so we couldn't go toe to toe and compete because there would only be able to be one winner. So we had to try and find ways of competing with a, with a restricted budget and with less resources. So things like futsal, because we had a school on the doorstep with an international size foot circle bringing in things like that I think were really important to the program and they really helped us things that I did that probably I look back on and think I'm not sure about that yeah I think there's probably a few things I would say I, th I had this process where uh, you had uh, under the 12s I think so the first age group in my phase they played in four positions and it was 25 percent over the course of the season that they played in those positions and then at 13s it was then three positions 33 percent of the time 14 was then um, three positions one was 50 one was 25 one was 25 so basically it was it was trying to taper them towards specialization at 16. now on paper and thinking logically it probably that probably does make sense for positions however what I didn't consider at the time was that well, on the 12s it's probably their first taste of 11 or 11 so to ask the player to be quite strict with the numbers so it might just be that they have four positions but to say 25% over the course of the season that might be a bit too um, process driven a bit too rigid so I think just a little bits and pieces like that we also I also put in a four we found that a lot of the opponents that we played played in a very similar style of play to us. So to try and manufacture a way of getting a flavour of different styles, different ways of playing, we did this four quarter approach. So in the first quarter, we might play normal, so like the philosophy of the club. The second period, we might drop off, so like a low block to counter. The third period might be a real high aggressive press. And then the fourth period might be whatever the game dictated. So uh, over the course of the game, we had four, maybe four different styles of playing. However, 
it was manufacturing it so the game sometimes did demand a low block to counter so we were almost just dropping into a low block and doing it for the sake of doing it because i wanted them to get a learning experience from it and get a flavor of the game because we didn't have lots of players were coming through the academy and playing in the first team the reality was that a lot of players were coming through the academy and playing in other clubs so we wanted to give them a flavor of the global game not just the way that we wanted to play it and also an issue with that is if you're a sub in period one you might be coming onto the game as a striker, just sitting in as a low block and not really doing what you want to be doing and scoring goals and stuff. So again, things like that, I think the intention was good. Uh, probably the idea was was well sort of merited, well intentioned, but I think probably the execution was maybe a bit too rigid and probably didn't cater for all the variables that we need to consider. I guess that's where now there's discussions around games programs and trying to have your you know thirty percent or whatever of the real tough ones are gonna be challenging, thirty that is a fifty fifty if you like, then thirty yeah. where you can really on it and excel. And that would hopefully naturally create those situations where if you're playing against a top team, you might be in a low block for a bit and you're gonna have to deal with it. Whereas yeah. when you're playing the teams that are maybe a you're a bit stronger than you can constantly go and press and you're not going to get found out as much. But I guess it's just the execution of the the thoughts rather than the thoughts themselves. Yeah. Okay, so l- last question for me. Um, ask this to everyone, and you can go for a player and a coach if you want, which is um, who's the best player you've worked with or against and why, or played with or against and why, and who's the best coach that you've worked with or against and why? That's a good question. Um, there's two players that probably stand out in terms of playing against. So we played against when James Madison was at Coventry uh, in the FA Youth Cup. We played against him and he was exceptional. He just ran the game. I think he'd already played in the first year of Coventry. But yeah, he was, he was probably one of the best players I've seen um, at that level. Harvey Elliott was at Fulham. I think he played, I think he was in under, England under 17s at the time, he was playing, he was an under 16, he was playing in the youth team, and again he just, you know, just stood out, just an unbelievable talent, uh, very creative, full of producer players that were on the floor and dribble, and, and he was playing up for two years in some cases and, and still stood out and shone, and obviously got a move to Liverpool, so I think those two standout examples that I've seen. We, we played a lot against Ethan Ampadu when he was at Exeter. So I probably saw him play from the age of around 11 or 12. Um, and again, an unbelievable talent. could play anywhere on the pitch. I think he played against us one time. I think he started off at centre-back, might have played right-back, played in midfield, and played on the top. He could just play anywhere. It was just that good and he was always playing up as well so very rarely was he in his own age group always being stretched and still stood out one of the star players so there are three I can think of off the top of my head um, so did you ask players I've worked with? With or against the those three or five if you want it as oh, right. coaches with or against as well oh, coaches um, coaches I think um, coaches I've coached against would probably be, um, I think again, probably using a, a relatively recent example which stood out, was um, Scott Parker, who was coaching Tottenham's youth team, uh, if I remember rightly, uh, a couple of years back in, again, in the FA Youth Cup. So we identified a, a rotation that we were doing early in the game. So they had a certain rotation to try and free up the player or create an overload. And we came up with a solution to try and prevent that, negate that being an issue, because it was an issue early on in the game if, if we'd allowed it to carry on. So we addressed that and then uh, putting out fires there. So we put out a fire there and then all of a sudden they're doing a different rotation and finding a different way or a different solution to that. Um, so whether, you know, the, the players have clearly been well drilled and well well informed on what on what they were doing. So I think the probably the time that he had put on the training ground to, to come up with those things was clearly uh, 
beneficial. I think he, he when we played there at Fulham's under 16s when he was there as a player, he, they finished training and he came over and watched. Um, and he was still playing at the time, so he clearly had a, an interest in co- going into coaching. Um, and it's, it's really nice to see him now in Premier League with, with Fulham, a young English manager getting an opportunity to coach. Because uh, he would be an example of someone who probably demonstrated on the day he wasn't a shout on the raver, he wasn't ranting, he wasn't telling him what to do, but they were coming up with solutions. And, I think if that's the measure of the coach, I think that's, that'd be a nice way to, to be measured, I think. Perfect. Listen, Graham, I really appreciate your time. And um, obviously, well, hopefully I'll see you soon. Um, and I'll catch up again at some point. Yeah, thanks a lot. Thanks for having me. Thanks for listening to the Sports Initiative podcast with me, Michael Wright. Please remember to follow us on Twitter, Facebook and Instagram at the Sports Initiative podcast and share this podcast with friends and family. I'll see you next week.